as I had to fight mine. I trust that you don't, but suppose you do. Will you know the counterfeit, or would you be like me? I spent my life in church from a youth up. I attended a denominational college and a denominational seminary. And never, ever in my entire life did I ever hear one single sermon on the devil. No teacher, no preacher, no professor, no person ever told me in my entire church life how to recognize the devil and defeat him. One enemy, 435 verses directly and indirectly concerning him in this Bible, and he remains the greatest mystery in the church today. Why? He was hidden from me. He does not have the power nor the ability to hide himself from Christians. Then who did it? My church did that to me. My church did that to me. They served him, not me. They did not prepare me for victory. They prepared me for defeat. Of course, they didn't know because they had it done to them too. But there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. When I resisted the devil, he fled from me. The angels were all around me. They'd been there all the time. They never made their person, presence known until I was at it. You've got two more to go. Physical, spiritual, and glorified. Well, if you don't want to believe that, I don't suppose your salvation hinge on whether or not you believe it. I just didn't want you surprised when you got there. I arrived outside of the gates of the third heaven. And the third heaven is God's throne room. It was identified by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 through 4. It is there where the angels received their assignment from. I arrived outside the gates of third heaven, ready to go and plead my case. The angel stopped me and said, wait, we brought you to that tunnel to perceive four truths. You saw only three. Go back and look again. They brought me back and let me look until 50 saints had been permitted to enter the gates of heaven one at a time. And I was still unable to perceive the fourth and final truth. So they told me what I was looking at, what they want me to be aware of, was the number of the saints going home. The insignificant number. And then they told me what I was looking at represented the sum total of God's harvest on the planet Earth for one 15-minute span of time that had occurred August 3, 1979, from 4.45 to 5 o'clock, approximating the distance in time from where the paramedic judged my body to be dead until it arrived at the hospital. In that same approximate 15-minute span of time, these 50 saints that I saw enter the third heaven had died the physical death on Earth. But they really had not died. It was their body that died. The physical body. And at that moment, they were expelled. No spirit can occupy a dead body. Every spirit is coming out at death. You're coming out of that body when it died. You're coming out. If you hadn't had your coming out party, save it to then because you're coming out. And you're going home. And you're not going home by the way of the grave. Don't you fear the grave. You'll never know the grave. That old body will know it, but you won't. You won't even make it to the funeral home. You go home before they can get that body down to the funeral home. That's one funeral you don't have to worry about. You won't have any part in that whatsoever. You're going home. These 50 saints had died in Christ and their spirit had gone home. Then the host of heaven revealed to me, along with them in that same time frame, 1,000 950 more humans had also died, but they didn't make it. 2,000 humans had died around the world in that one 15-minute span, but only 50 made it to heaven. 50 out, 50 out of 2,000 is 2 and 1 half percent. 97.5 didn't make it. The host of heaven said to me why I was permitted to see that on that day because it represented the spiritual condition of the planet Earth. They testified to me that day. If that would have been the day that Jesus would have returned, he would have found two and one half percent of the planet Earth ready to go home. Think a moment. If it really had occurred August 3rd, 1979, would you have been in that number? Then thank God for his mercy. Long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. If you don't know what your priorities ought to be tonight, ask me. I'll tell you. I arrived back outside the gates of the third heaven, ready to go and plead my case again. 
Angels stopped me again. Twice I'd been there. Twice they stopped me. They now said to me, if you go in those gates, you can't come out. You're going to have to stay till he brings you back. Glory to God. Did you know he's coming back? You know he's bringing his saints with him this time? You know what else he's bringing this time? A rod of iron. He's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as a lion. They won't spit on him anymore. Those days are over. But if I can't come out, I said, my body won't get up off that bed. Still in love with this old piece of clay. After having been all the way through the second heaven, seen all the things that they let me see, and I'm still pleading for that old piece of clay. But you said that I could ask him. The angel said, you can. Just don't go through the gates. Stand outside the gates. Talk to him. He will hear you. Boldly I came to the gate. I began to plead my case to a God I could not see. No sound in all of heaven save the sound of my plea. When I finished, only when I finished, did he answer me. He spoke to me in an audible voice. I'm going to quote verbatim part of what he said. The rest I'm going to paraphrase. A lot of people get shook up when I tell them I'm going to quote verbatim the living God. God don't mind being quoted verbatim. He gave us his word. <laughs> Every time we read it, we're quoting him verbatim. So he don't mind or, or he wouldn't have gave us his word. And every time we read it, we're quoting God. So he don't mind being quoted. What I discovered that day was he hates to be misquoted. He hates it so much, he said in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, Woo! Have you ever presumed to speak a word in God's name? But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Unquote. It indicates spiritual as well as physical death, but in God's timing. I choose carefully my words when I quote verbatim the living God because I got to give an account of them, not you. All you have to give an account of tonight is what you do with what you hear. I got to give an account of what I'm saying. And the day I give an account of it, if you belong to God, you'll be a witness there. He spoke to me in an audible voice, but it wasn't anything like the voice the devil had used that tried to deceive me. It wasn't sweet. It wasn't lovely. It wasn't even desirable. The voice that God spoke to me in is described in John chapter 12, verse 28-29 as thunder. The living God spoke to me in thunder. As the thunderous voice of the living God came down over those gates, before his words reached me, the tone of his wrath had put me on my face, had zapped every ounce of strength in my being, as my God proceeded to tell me who I was, not who I thought I was. I discovered those two people were not even kin. <laughs> Quote, Your faith is dead. Your works are in vain. The life that you lived and offered to me as a life of Christian service is an abomination that I rejected in the Pharisee. What made you think I would accept such an offering from a Laodicean type Christian? In fact, untold millions are living the same kind of life that you live and they stand in danger of my everlasting wrath. Unquote the living God. No, Lord, no, wait a minute, that's not me. He was calling me a Laodicean type Christian. You know what a Laodicean type Christian is? You can read him about him in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. But he's the hypocrite that plays church. He goes to church and with his lips he sings, Oh, how I love Jesus. But that lying rascal can't wait to get out of church. Show the world who he really loves by serving the devil all week long. Next meeting day is right back in church singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. All this old world of compadres out in the world peeping through the window laughing at him and saying, Boy, if that's a Christian, I'm glad I'm not one. That's why God hates him. 
because he did what the devil could not do by playing church. He turned the world off to Jesus Christ. If you've never heard anything in your life, saints, share this. For the sake of your soul, if you can't be a light, don't you dare be a stumbling block. Don't even go down there if you can't be a light. Because if you do, you heap to yourself coals of fire. That's not me. That's not me. Heaven was made of brass. He wouldn't answer me. Suddenly a witness spoke. In one word, that witness convicted me. Now I know why every knee will bow and every tongue will confess because the witness that got me. Watch out. <laughs> he might be waiting for you. Jesus identified that witness in your Bible. Matthew 12, 37. By your own words, you will be justified. By your own words, you will be condemned. I offer you that witness. This old tongue. James said it set on fire by fires of hell. You cut this flesh with a knife, it'll heal. But you cut this heart with that tongue, it'll never heal. You go ahead and say it. You won't unsay it. Read Matthew 12, 36. Your words are spiritual. You don't speak them. You birth them. The most deadly weapon you possess is that tongue. You have power of life and death in that tongue. You could be guilty of murder with that tongue. By the word, every word I'd ever spoken, every promise I'd ever made, all of them broken. That is me. That's really me. I said that. I did that. Thirty years. Every promise I'd ever made to the church, I made from a heart of pure intention. But somehow, some way, I had broke every one of them, including even the sacred vows that I had made to my own family. I had broken every one of them. That is me. That's really me. And then the plea come. But Lord, I stood on the sidewalk and preached to the passerby. I went up to the jail and held service with the prisoners. I opened my home. I shared with others. I did all these wonderful work. I was there when you preached on the sidewalk. I was there when you opened your home and shared with others. I saw your works. All of them. They were good works. My works. The works that I have ordained for my church. My people offer me those works every day. But in your case, they're in vain. You didn't do them for me. You did them for a false God. And I said in my word, I am a jealous God. I'll have no other gods before me. Doesn't matter how good your works. If you do them for a false God, don't offer them to me. I won't take them. But Lord, I didn't do them for a false God. I did them for you. I called you Lord every day. Yes, you call me Lord, but you never made me Lord. What a difference. To call him Lord gives him a title. To make him Lord promotes him to ruler of life. Who is your Lord? But Lord, I did all this works in your name. You did it in my name, but not for me. I couldn't see that false God. Then he named him. Satan's number one selling false God. The one that you should fear more than all the rest. But you won't. Like me, you love him too much. Satan's number one selling false God. S-E-L-F. -L. Lovely old self. Because self-ruled in my life, Jesus Christ had no place. Said it in his word. He that will not deny father, mother, sister, brother, son or daughter, husband, wife, or even self, not worthy of the kingdom of God. They took me away, let me regain my composure, brought me back and let me plead, till the scales fell off my eye. Suddenly I was able to see what it was they wanted me to see all the time. I was pleading for the wrong life. A life that came from dirt. It was going back to dirt no matter what. Housed within was an immortal life. A life that would never end. A life that was precious to him. Nothing mattered now. Not my life, not my soul. The only thing matter now. I not hurt my father again. When this life meant no more. He gave it back. Sit me back to do what I've done. Touch on five quick points. Very quickly, I'd like to share the five-point message we have to the church. And then we're going to go in and I'm going to share with you what I saw concerning the last generation of time where we are today and how through great deception this adversary has already got us in the bag, so to speak. And he's slowly pulling the strings tight. Very, very tight around our throat. The five-point message to the church that we've been trying to deliver for some 18 years now. Point number one, this is the Laodicean church age in which we live today. 
for the overwhelming majority of so-called Christians, I'm sorry to report to you, are just that, so-called. They're mouth professors and not heart possessors. And unless they wake up with this shaking, he's going to spew them right out of his mouth. His promise to do that is found in your Bible, Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Point number two, your adversary, the devil, is a personal and powerful adversary whose ability the church has grossly, and I do mean grossly, underestimated. I'm going to give you one piece of evidence to consider. If that don't touch you, nothing on earth will. That piece of evidence, the church itself. Ha, ha, ha. Let's take what the world considers the uh, average modern church fellowship, stick it out there and let the unchurched world look at it. What do they see? A wet noodle, reflecting no power, most cases no compassion, no love. Take the whole church body and put it together. What does the unchurched world look at when they see it? A fractured, broken, fragmented body, divided over a, a, a hundred pieces where a great number of its own members spend most of their time vilifying another member, allowing the devil to roam within the church. As a born-again believer, you're to give no place in your life to the devil, no fear, no love. Meet him on the field of battle and defeat him. Point number three, if you're ever going to experience any of God's miraculous power in your own personal life, you have to live that life, not talk it, but live it. When the folks down where you work, shop, live, eat, sleep, people who know your private life and can still believe the words of your mouth when you testify for Jesus, then you can call upon his name and expect to hear from him. Point number four. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 uh, and, and 37 just before his second return to planet earth, conditions on earth would once again mimic the conditions of Noah's day when every thought of man's heart was continually evil. Basically man had but two priorities, wealth and pleasure. Wealth and pleasure, right where we are today. Keep your eye upon the eastern sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. It is close, oh so very close. Now that brings us to point number five, the major point, the main point, the one that, in reality, why he sent me back. Point number five, he's recruiting an army, and I'm one of his recruiting sergeants. He's going to shake this world one more time. He said in Ephesians chapter 5, I will have me a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. How is he going to do that, you say? Matthew told us when he quoted John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. It is he who will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Little church, we've had the water. We've had the Holy Ghost. Get ready now. Yonder comes the fire. The third and final baptism. But there is really a little problem with a few of us in the church. Just a teeny bit problem. It's going to take a blowtorch. <laughs> He's going to have to scorch us up one side and down the other to make us turn loose this world. But if you think God can shake this world with carnal-minded Christians, I invite you to read the book one more time. But this time, read all of it.